My name is Nela Haldenam. I'm an assistant science editor at The Scientist. And I started uh, with, um, or I joined Reproducibility for Everyone initiative um, about two years ago as a postdoc. Um, and at that point, I had some issues trying to um, reproduce an experiment that I had read about in a paper. Um, and I was trying to repeat it and I just, I just couldn't. And so I was uh, having some similar issues with my own experiments. And so I tried to look for ways to improve the reproducibility of my work. Um, and then I read about, um, or I, I learned about the Reproducibility for Everyone initiative. Um, and I attended one of their workshops and it was really great. And so I, uh, I decided to join. So who are we? Uh, let's start there. Um, Reproducibility for Everyone community is, is a group of scientists who are um, spread between academia and industry. Um, and we have a common goal in wanting to improve the reproducibility of science. We have members uh, who are spread all over the world and they help in developing new slides, uh, hosting workshops like what we are doing now today uh, and in a bunch of other different uh, topics in trying to come up with different ways to improve the reproducibility of science. Um, so one of the big things that we did together is to develop this uh, open access workshop. And like I said just now, um, you can use these slides and you can modify them to turn them into a journal club that you can host in your own lab, uh, or maybe turn it into a seminar that you can teach at your, uh, at your own institute. Um, and if you, if you like the workshop and you would like to join us in hosting it at different conferences, um, please, um, we are definitely happy to have you uh, reach out to us uh, using the link over here. So uh, let's start with the first um, module here. And today, the first one we're going to talk about is data management. And so um, uh, this actually really helped me a lot is to think about a project directory. So here, basically, um, you're, uh, you're structuring your folders dependent on the different projects that you have. And so for instance, the next time that you start a new project, just create a new folder and say, this is, um, depending on what it is, this is, for instance, my third mass project that I'm going to be studying the protein WINT, for instance. Um, and within that folder, you start developing or you start putting different subfolders, uh, one for the methods, one for the raw data, uh, for any kind of analysis that you do. Should you have a script, you can make a folder for the script, uh, for a possible manuscript in the future. And then um, this bottom one is one that really helps a lot, is to include a small readme um, file and or an ELN link to link to your uh, electronic lab notebook. Um, what I mean by a readme file is a short document that um, just explains how you've structured your data and where to find everything. So now that you have uh, these different subfolders, you can start to fill them in with your raw data, your data analysis, and your manuscripts. Uh, the important thing is to make sure that you uh, store your raw data never throw that away uh, and make sure that you back up your data. Um, the ideal way is to make sure that you back it up three times in a synchronized way on different locations. Hi, I'm Ruchika. I'm trained as a membrane protein biologist. So besides structuring and organizing the project directory, it is also important to create some simple rules about how you name each file you create at the beginning of the project, which can go a long way to keep your data more organized. Basically, here are some examples of uh, file, file, file naming convention. Basically, rules don't matter. What matters is that you have rules and you stay consistent with it. So start simple and pick up a couple of rules for naming your files. So here is uh, an example how files could be named. So you can see how this name has different components like date, project identifier, experiment, then type, uh, and uh, type name and then version. It's up to you how specific you want to, you would like the file name to be and the more specific you want, the longer name would be. Generally, the file information moves from journal to specific from left to right. Hi everyone, um, my name is Nafisa and I am an assistant professor at Midwestern University. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, electronic lab notebooks. Um, why should you even consider using an, elec an electronic lab notebook? Well, these are some benefits. Um, so they're easily searchable. So you can, you know, um, put in keywords and look for certain experiments or resources. Um, in my lab, we do uh, survival surgeries. So we in induced ischemic stroke in um, rodents. And um, sometimes I forget what our surgery setup looks like. So I've taken a few pictures and uploaded them into our lab notebook. 
So I know every time I'm doing the surgery, sort of, you know, what the best way to set up is. And this is maintained by um, Harvard. And you can see at the top, there's different names of lab notebooks. And then on, along the uh, left side, there are different types of options or features. So it's a really good resource. Uh, so hi, uh, I am Hao Yi. My pronouns are he, him. And I am the reproducibility librarian at the University of Florida Health Science Center Libraries. So I'm going to talk to you about organizing and sharing research protocols. And it's really important to use designated repositories to store this kind of information, to store these protocols, instead of something like the supplement of a journal or you know, the supplementary files in your publications. So here are some repositories where you can deposit and share your protocol. Uh, the ones that we're highlighting here are Protocol Exchange, uh, which is one that's hosted by Nature Research. Uh, and another one, which is protocols.io. When writing a protocol, it's best if you think of it, right, as this document that can stand on its own as a self-contained scientific publication. Um, you want to make sure that there's enough information about what the protocol is trying to do so that there's, there's sufficient context for understanding kind of what the end result is going to be. Right, so you want to include a, a three to four sentence abstract that describes the context of the protocol, and in the protocol itself, you want to include sufficient details. Right, so you know how long each step is supposed to take. Um, if you're adding reagents, uh, what, how much of each reagent to add, um, where they come from in terms of the vendor or the catalog number. Um, and you can also include uh, pictures along the way uh, in your protocol. And that kind of helps to make sure that if someone is reproducing your protocol, they can check what they have against your, your pictures of you know, what the results should be at each step. Uh, if you're using software, what those software are and what those versions are, the chronology of steps, making sure that uh, when you're developing your protocol that you use a tool that has versioning uh, so that you can track changes in, in your protocol over time. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Rindu Gutum, and currently I'm a postdoc uh, at uh, Department of Computational Biology, IIIT in New Delhi. So I'll be uh, covering the bioinformatics uh, tools for computational re reproducibility. So what literate uh, programming language actually allows is like uh, uh, interactive data exploration on the fly and also we can actually uh, write uh, our data uh, write our codes and also uh, execute the same codes at the from with a single document itself and it allows also us to actually easily share uh, uh, across uh, collaborators so best we start with is the jupyter notebook and uh, also there are options are available for our user users typically are marked down with kenitar so if you actually get a glimpse about a Jupyter notebook. Typically here we can see there is like a code that has been there, which has been uh, Lawrence PY. And this particular code can be actually directly called to the notebook itself, which is the Python notebook here. And execution of the code actually can give us the uh, interactive view of the results itself. And dynamically we can actually change the N value here and we can actually generate uh, the automatically the uh, output itself on the fly. So this is the best part of uh, literate programming, which actually allows us to do a, a interactive uh, data analysis. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Peterson. I'm the manager of learning and training at Stella Mosh University Library in South Africa. When we speak about producing reproducible research, we cannot leave data and code sharing out of the conversation. Uh, I am Betul al -Murzuk. I am a computation biologist. This is my Twitter account. Please feel free to reach out at any time with any kind of questions. So what I use usually is this general purpose repository. You have all the time, you've got this picture, the node. Uh, I mostly use the node. Uh, these are all free digital repository, but sometimes you have this uh, limit of the data that you can upload. With picture, you've got five gigabytes. With the node, you've got, it's more generous, you've got 50 gigabytes per data set. And what I love about the node, particularly, you can link it to GitHub is integrate with other application. So this is an example. This is, um, uh, yeah, I've taken it from my 
repository and from my scenario. This is basically a, just a two minutes of presentation. It's nothing really significant, it's nothing really special. Just a two minutes of presentation. I made it with the uh, Markdown. But what I did, it was in my repository, it was in my GitHub to, to make a resistant identifier or DOI, I linked it to Zenergo. And you can link it by creating a release in GitHub. Uh, and it's really, it's very easy. It's like three steps outlined here. Uh, you create that release and you get the badges very, very quick. And then you get what we call uh, the DOI. Uh, it says here, when you go to Zenodo, it says that it's an available in GitHub. It does link it, does link the code to it. And you got all this metadata here. You got all the views and how many one is downloaded your data. Uh, and you can get like not just one version, you can get one version, two or three. In this case, I've got four version of this two minutes of presentation. Uh, 